I'm Kerry O'Brien, and it's time for The Fix. First up, Deputy Finance Minister David Masondo is in the hot seat to explain how the state plans to grow the economy amid spiraling inflation and a bleak global financial trajectory. We also break it down at municipal level to see how this sphere of government will perform its tough act of providing basic services given its precarious finances. Then we drill down with Public Enterprises Minister Pravin Gordon on how he plans to keep the lights on without sinking the entire economy. And as is custom, we take a look at what's made headlines in the weekend newspapers and why. The Fix starts now. Welcome to this edition of The Fix, where every Sunday we hold the decision makers to account. We tell you why it matters, how it affects you, and why you should care. Now, as expected, the Moody's ratings agency put South Africa on notice as it changed its outlook to negative, citing material risk that the South African government will not be able to stem the deterioration of the country's finances. Joining me in the studio to talk about this is Deputy Finance Minister David Masondo, as well as municipal finance expert Mr. Paul Berkowitz. Minister, Deputy Minister, good morning. Mr. Berkowitz, good morning. Um, it's a grim picture. Um, despite the celebrations of yesterday and that wonderful lifting of uh, the, the trophy uh, there in Japan. But back to reality for South Africa, um, surely Moody's uh, ratings um, outlook didn't surprise you? Uh, good morning, Karimen, to your listeners. Um, yes, we are worried about the current economic situation. We have a plan. We've released a discussion document uh, titled Economic Strategy Competition. It's a discussion document which is gaining traction in society. What we want to do as government based on that discussion document is a number of things. Amongst others is to make sure that we grow our manufacturing. You'll recall manufacturing in 1994 used to contribute uh, almost 24% of the GDP. It has declined. It's around 12%, I mean 13% now. And we think that manufacturing is very important for us to re uh, rebuild the economy and create jobs. Second thing in that document, what we're saying is that uh, it's important to uh, break the barriers to entry for SMMEs. And these barriers are not just from the private sector, but also from government itself. The amount, the turnaround times in terms of approval, for uh, SMMEs to do certain things in government, it could be a piece of land on which they want to operate and local municipalities, they take forever to basically go back to the municipalities. And uh, with regard to the uh, barriers to entry posed by the private sector, uh, big companies, our view is not about big companies are bad, it's about the articulation between small companies and big companies. In other words, if you are a big company, the questions that we should be asking ourselves is, what are the things that you are doing to support the SMMEs? Could we supplying something that you can allow as a small businesses to up supply uh, certain things that you require as a big company. But Minister, with respect, uh, Deputy Minister, with respect, uh, the plans that you've articulated are not new. They are tough to negotiate. In fact, Finance Minister Mbaweni said this is a plan that still needs to be spoken about. The unions have put you on notice um, in terms of the public um, sector wage bill. Now, you've demonstrated that uh, you're going to be freezing uh, minister salaries, MEC salaries, in an attempt to get what Workers to understand that they too are not the only ones that's going to tighten their belts. Uh, but they are saying that um, they're not going to stand for your austerity measures. How are you going to uh, convince them uh, to move beyond their sectoral interests and act in the national interest? I, I think you're right. The wage bill is a big problem. And if we don't tackle it, all of us will be in trouble. We won't be able to even to meet our obligations to citizens generally, providing water, electricity, education. So what we will put in before the labor movement, the idea that we should consider not rising, raising uh, the wages and salaries above the inflation. Not only them, but all of us in government, including public representatives, uh, councillors, MECs, 
and ministers. Just to make sure that uh, all of us we sacrifice uh, in this difficult economic situation because if we don't all of us were going to sink. But the workers are saying that they are the ones that historically make the sacrifices if you look at the levels of corruption in the state uh, by senior um, state officials with very few people being held accountable going to jail or even facing charges for that matter they believe that they are not going to be able to um, carry those sacrifices um, and that you need to actually give them an audit of how you're going to uh, cut a public service that actually needs more public servants, the police, the nurses, the teachers. Um, so this is going to be, um, you know, a trapeze act that is going to be very, very difficult to, to carry out. Indeed, the, the problem is not the number of uh, workers in the public service. Actually, the number of public workers has been declining but the wage bill has been going up and that has to do partly with the negotiation settlement that was uh, made I think 2009-2010 I saw on that point uh, Deputy Minister Faith Mutambi attacking Tito when he's saying that um, he shouldn't be um, shooting from the hip that it's not her fault uh, Mr. Baloy was also um, a predecessor um, accused of, of blowing the budget but the reality of the matter is that uh, the state is the largest employer, so it's not um, a surprise that your wage bill is this high. Mr. Berkowitz, let me bring you in uh, here. Um, we've got runaway debt, and the servicing of that debt is, of course, what is hurting everybody. Uh, municipalities is where the tire hits the tar. That's where businesses need their water to come from, the electricity to come from. Municipalities um, are often in financial um, chaos. Um, if we just look at the, the AG's report. Um, given uh, Moody's change in outlook, what is the future of municipal finances um, and are the measures that we have there enough uh, to signal confidence to any investor? Thanks, Ms. Brown. I think the municipalities have been in they've had a, a tumultuous time and it's not going to get easier over the medium term. As you've said, for many years, the, municipal, the state of the municipal finances report from National Treasury has indicated that too many municipalities, including metros and what we call secondary cities, that mm. one step below, they face challenges, they're under a lot of pressure. The pressures are many. The pressures come directly from the problems at ESCOM because the increase, the doubling of the electricity input costs between 2008 and 2012 has meant that municipalities have had to pass that on. Mm. The problem with trying to find new taxes to service the budget in general um, cascades down because the, the biggest source of revenue, the biggest tax base, for most of the big municipalities is middle class and upper middle class consumers and because of the structures of the water and the electricity price tariffs there's a huge amount of cross subsidization the treasury even mentioned this in the medium term budget policy statement that many rich consumers are moving off the grid because mm. they can that has a that has got an incredibly negative impact on the tax base of large municipalities. Mm. And at the same time, the, the equitable share, as we've seen yesterday, the equitable, well, on, on earlier this week, the equitable share that's being transferred from national to local government is going to be cut. So municipalities are being squeezed. Municipalities have, the smaller municipalities have had structural backlogs and infrastructure backlogs that come from apartheid days and those haven't been eradicated mm. and there's no easy solution in sight at the moment. Uh, Deputy Minister Moody's when they cited the reasons they were saying that um, the government will not succeed in arresting the deterioration of its finances through a revival in economic growth and fiscal consolidation methods. That is a very negative outlook. You have an investment conference that 
kicks off next week. Uh, the president told us that uh, you are in fact oversubscribed, over a thousand investors are coming, both local and international. How does Moody's um, uh, outlook affect um, your expectations of this investment conference? This is the second one that you're having. Um, do you think that people are going to have an appetite for the South African mar market? Uh, I think they will. I mean, firstly, th there are things that are entailed in our growth plans that we are already implementing. For instance, the visa issue, uh, where in, in the past the idea was that people who were tourists, they must bring their bridge certificates. We've done away with that, and we think that there will be an outflow, an inflow of tourists in South Africa. Next week, uh, we are hosting an investor conference. Everyone is interested in... Um, attending the conference and this conference is not a talk shop people will be making pronouncements on their commitment to invest in south africa and investment career is very important for economy in that when people put money into our economy you will be able to generate tax will be able to generate employment and grow this economy but the problem is that there isn't a faith in the leadership of this government to see things through. You are on a war path, for example, with your alliance partner, Kosatu, and of course there are other federations that are outside of the alliance that you also have to negotiate with. They have been unequivocal. They are saying that um, they are not going to be the brunt of this. Now, where exactly are those negotiations at? And are you convinced? that uh, President Ramaphosa and the cabinet will be able to get those people on board. You might, for example, be able to get Kusatu workers on board, but how are you going to get SAFTU on board, for example? Um, first, the negotiations have already started. Before the minister uh, presented the MTBS, um, there were negotiations, there were discussions on Monday just to take the alliance partners through what it's entailed in our thinking in so far as how we take ourselves out of this situation and present the problems as they are. Yes, I cannot say that the, the, there's some agreement in all the things that uh, the minister or that things that we've presented, but negotiations are ongoing. And I'm definitely sure that it's not everything which is in the discussion paper or the thing that we're proposing that uh, the alliance partners will be objectionable to. Uh, for instance, I spoke about the manufacturing infrastructure as one of the most important um, uh, things that we should do as government. I do not think that uh, the alliance uh, partners will have issues with, uh, with that. That is the government investing in infrastructure, telecommunication, water, electricity. But job cuts are inevitable. Um, we've already got over 10 million people unemployed. There is no appetite from anybody uh, for more uh, jobs to be lost because you need people to have cash to be able to stimulate demand and to be able to buy goods. But it is going to come, and it is going to have to come in state-owned enterprises. I'm going to be speaking with Minister Pravin uh, after this um, uh, segment uh, with you. But how are you going to put that on the table and convince workers that job cuts is in the larger interests of the economy because that's essentially what people are going to be fighting for. You're going to be taking money out of their pockets. You're going to be taking um, wages that often subsidize between six and eight people off the table. You, the, you, there's no avoiding it. Where there will be job cut, I think the conversation should be where should those workers go? Um, and it's for this reason that we are interested in expanding the economy in uh, making sure that investors invest in the country. And where there will be job cuts, we have to think about where we take uh, some of these uh, workers to. For instance, if for, for argument's sake, there is job cuts in defense as, it, as, as a department, we need to think about where should we take those uh, soldiers to? Should we take them to some security um, areas where there's some kind of shortfall? what role should we be placing them to so that uh, we don't put people just on the street for it. It's not in the interest of government in South Africa to have people who are jobless because that generates a whole range of problems, social problems, crime, mm. and so forth and so forth. So we have a multi-prong 
uh, approach to this issue around jo uh, uh, jobs because if the, the, in instances where there will be job losses, we've got to think about where those workers should go. Mr. Berkowitz, let me uh, focus on the municipality of Itikwini. I read a very interesting piece in the Mail and Guardian. Uh, there's a new mayor, obviously, and there are two things that have happened since uh, the scandal broke around Zandile Gumede. The first thing is that the security cameras have apparently been put back on in the building. And the second thing is that the finance committee is actually up and running again. And one of the issues there, of course, was um, the way in which tenders were allocated. We know that big pick-it-up tender. And then, of course, there were these business organizations and forums uh, that essentially railroaded themselves into um, forcing the government to allocate contracts to them. Many of them, Ms. Gumede's supporters. How does a municipality like Itaquini recover uh, given the downgrade, because it has an immediate impact on a place like, like, like uh, KwaZulu Natal and Itikwini. Uh, it's a tourism hub, um, there's the port, uh, you know, a lot of the elements in our economy comes together there. Um, how do you fix Itikwini um, uh, given the mess that Zandile Gomede has left? I think the good news, Karima, is that for many years Etiquini Metro was the gold standard for many reasons. It, uh, the technological advances that the municipality made, the way that it tackled um, unpaid water and electricity accounts, the, the way it actually was proactive in getting uh, consumers to commit to paying and, and widening its tax base. It's, it's indisputable that under the previous mayor, Gumede, the metro did go backwards quite a lot, but it's a very strong metro. It's, it's for years historically had very strong cash flows and been very well managed. And not just in its day-to-day -day operations, but in the very sophisticated ways that it's tackled big infrastructure projects and project management. In fact, it's, it, it, it even at one point opened a center of excellence of sorts to teach um, and, and to impart its learnings to other municipalities. So I remain optimistic when it comes to Etiquini. Some uh, a municipality like Umsunduzi, for example, which um, has had problems for many years, that's a different story. Mm. Um, to answer your question, the short version, how does a municipality recover? In some ways it goes back to the basics. It's, it's a very boring, well-treaded cliche, but uh, there'll be better oversight of tenders being awarded. Uh, there'll be an honest attempt and the uh, requisite political will to stamping out corruption and, and getting back on track. But Etiquini, for example, doesn't have the problems that we have in Joburg when it comes to um, electricity debt in the tens of, mm. of billions, for example, which is now a new problem that's being created for ESCOM where they tackle this non-payment. ESCOM this week has already started to cut off parts of Soweto and Orange Farm. And what this budget has brought to the fore, it's been a very difficult budget, a very brave budget, because it's been a very honest budget. Uh, the, the kind of things you're talking about, the fights between previous Minister Mutambi and uh, Minister Mbueni, and the kind of discussions that will be had between Labour and government, these same discussions suddenly, for the first time in years, maybe decades, the tackling of um, a culture of non-payment in very specific parts of Joburg is going to have to be addressed. Uh, Mr. Masondo, let me uh, bring it back to you. Before uh, Minister Fa uh, Tito Mbaweni um, uh, announced his medium-term uh, budget policy statement, you were touring the provinces. And of course we know that the provinces still get the lion's share of uh, the, the budget. Um, you were also a previous finance MEC in Limpopo. Uh, patronage has really established itself in provinces. Um, what did you find in the provinces and how are you going to um, do the kind of interventions that requires you uh, to prevent people from keep on rolling over budgets? We've seen in places people not being able to spend uh, and of course the runaway and rampant corruption. I mean firstly the, the, people, the main purpose of the road show was to say government must pay the suppliers on time, but also encouraging um, the citizens to pay what they owe to the municipalities. So it's generally the uh, culture of, I mean, the, the campaign was about uh, promoting the culture of payment. But that how does an unemployed us. person pay? No, for those who can pay, for those who can pay, we're saying 
please do pay because there's a number of people who can pay but they're not paying and, and how do you reverse that if the leadership core that's running the municipality are actually corrupt if people take the cue from the political leadership no those ones who are found to be corrupt they need to be arrested and I'm glad that there are a lot of things that are coming out of the Zondo Commission and I think we need to act with speed just to send a clear message that corruption it's not good for society, corruption is bad for our economy, and people should go to jail for uh, their corrupt acts that they embark upon, which is very problematic for, 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 for South Africa. So that's one of the things that we are going to be raising very seriously with the municipalities, that um, as long as we don't tackle the problem of corruption, people may not find it desirable for them to continuously pay for the services that, they, they, that we provide as We're government. We're literally out of time. I'm going to ask you a question about ESCOM simply because I'm having the uh, Public Enterprises Minister up next. Finance Minister Tito Mbaweni said he's going to watch what the board and the management do uh, in terms of managing their finances and see um, how he's going to relate to them in terms of the debt relief that they require. What exactly does that mean for you? I mean, first Firstly, putting money into ESCOM is not sustainable. Um, ESCOM has to do, has to focus on two things, amongst others. One, their cost structure, um, ranging from the coal and, and other primary sources of energy, because that has had a huge impact insofar as the ability to uh, operate efficiently and optimally. The other side is revenue. They need to go all out there and recover the revenue and working together with all of us as citizens making sure that we pay as so that it generates enough revenue for its Well that's an excellent note to end this part of the conversation with that was of course a Deputy Finance Minister David Masondo as well as Municipal Finance Expert Paul Berkowitz. Up next we talk to Public Enterprises Minister Pravin Gordon on how to keep the lights on without tanking the economy. Stay with us.